This series was intended as a basic lesson in the phylogenetics of evolution, the scientific theory of biodiversity, or how life diversifies from one or a few to many different varieties. As the theory of evolution pertains only to biodiversity and not anything else that changes over time or the origin of anything other than species, then the first episode of this series talked about the current common concept of what constitutes life, biota. The second episode discussed our domain, a taxonomic concept that was proposed in 1990 and then added to the original seven ranks already established by Carolus Linnaeus in 1735. But of course we now know that there's more than just these because we keep finding new clades, new taxonomic categories that we have to make up names for. And many of them, especially the earliest ones, are identified by a lot of dry scientific jargon and consequently would not have made very engaging episodes on their own, especially since we're only talking about the chemical functions of unicellular microbes. Since most of you are not bioscience students, I compressed the next seven clades into a single episode to get up to our kingdom and hopefully hold the interest of the average viewer. It took four more episodes to show the next five ranks up to our phylum, correlating with fossils from the very beginning of the Paleozoic era. So we'd already come quite a long way, even before the Cambrian period. I didn't want any of these videos to be limited to technical lectures on comparative anatomy, so I left a lot of that out, though I admit that I really should have made more than just 16 episodes to cover the next 34 clades of transitional species to bring us up to our class. Linnaeus invented his system before the scientific fields of genetics or evolution or paleontology had been discovered, so he had no idea these ranks were all connected the way they are, both phylogenetically and chronologically. Without a working theory of evolution, he wouldn't have understood any of that, and he lamented that he could not make sense of the branching tree pattern that, of apparent relationships that his system had revealed. For example, 13 more episodes covering 14 more clades, and we get up to our taxonomic order, which coincidentally also brings us to the end of the Paleozoic era of reptiles and into the Cenozoic era of mammals. Since then, we've done one clade per episode, but that was still nine episodes ago, and we've just come to our genus, Homo. We finally come to the emergence of man. Some of the more astute among you have probably already guessed that the very next episode, and technically the last one of this series, I'm sorry to say, will be about the different species within our genus. This episode, however, will talk about some of the changes that occurred in a lineage of bipedal apes that made them what we are, how they, or rather we, became human. In the last episode, we mentioned how Kenyanthropus platyops had been classified both as a human and as an australopith, because some members of these groups are so similar to each other that it's hard to distinguish one group from the other. And one point of confusion is that they're not really different groups. The genus name Australopithecus was invented a century ago when Linnaean taxonomy was still dominant. So it was listed as a sister instead of a parent group and is thus paraphyletic, meaning that it includes most of these except for those, arbitrarily excluding evident descendants for no defensible reason. Because Linnaeus didn't know about evolution, his taxonomic system didn't and couldn't account for it. For centuries, scientists have tried to modify it to use it anyway, but it just doesn't work. So now we use cladistic classification, which is monophyletic, meaning that it applies to the parent group and all of its progeny too, not just some of them according to our whim. As I've said so many times in this series before, you can't grow out of your ancestry. So it makes no sense to say that your ancestors were one thing, but you turned into something else and that you're not what they are or anymore. As this series has shown from the beginning, since evolution is descent with inherent modification, then every new species that ever evolved was just a modified version of whatever its ancestors were. Logically, then, you should still belong to every clade your ancestors did, even if you start a new one for your own legacy. And we don't know whether Kenyanthropus or any individual from any species of Australopiths were necessarily directly ancestral to our species, but both are probable, and our taxonomic system should be able to account for that. Just as this series defines a monkey as any member of the taxonomic suborder Anthropoidea, which also known as semiforms, meaning that by this definition we are monkeys too, this series also defines a human as any member of the genus Homo. So the people we're talking about today could begin with Kenyanthropus, but we'll focus more on early human species from the Pliocene period, like Homo habilis or Rudifensis, leading to Erectus. Remember that this lineage is closer to the gracile Australopiths, not the robust ones. 
And one of the first comparisons that people make between humans and other apes is that gorillas and chimpanzees are so much stronger than we are. I mean, look at these guys. They're built like trucks. Now, part of that could be that they spend their whole lives working out for upper body strength, but that doesn't account for everything. I mean, this guy lives in a language research center at Georgia State University, and he spends most of his time playing video games. Seriously, he just naturally looks like a power lifter. So why did we become so graceful, meaning thin and frail? And one reason is that we have at least two genes that actually restrict the growth of our muscles and the necessary thickness of the bones they're attached to. In our case, it's the myostatin gene, also called growth and differentiation factor eight. Defects in or chemicals blocking this gene result in a substantial increase of two to three times the normal muscle mass, depending on the species. In a couple rare cases, human children have been born with a double copy of defective myostatin or with it naturally blocked, in either case resulting in twice the muscle mass and half the fat. That means that we have a gene that only allows us roughly half the muscularity of the other apes. They have myostatin too, but for them the dominant regulator is called activin A, and it is obviously a more lenient regulator because it allows them to have so much more than we get. Another difference is that they have slightly longer muscle fibers, and two-thirds, 67% of those, are fast twitch fibers, which are up to one and a half times stronger than our muscles, pound for pound. But their muscles also require more energy and become fatigued faster. Whereas the majority, 60% of our muscle fibers, are of the slow twitch variety, which are not only more economical, longer lasting, on less energy, but they're also much better at fine motor control. Even at the cost of superhuman strength, the combination of traits for increased endurance and precise dexterity would see a selective advantage in the lifestyle of early humans. The physical abilities that we and they inherited from our ancestral species were very generalized. We were like a sort of jack of all trades, which meant that while different animals could exceed us in their own particular specialties, we could accomplish a wider variety of tasks in a greater range of environments than most other animals could. We can swim or climb to hunt or forage, eating meat or plants, as well as clams or bugs or pretty much anything edible. And that versatility made us more adaptable than most other mammals right from the start. As we mentioned before, about four million years ago, the lush African jungles where Ardipithecus lived were thinning into drier, sparser woodlands in which Australopithecus lived. And this trend continued until much of that land was open savanna with very few trees at all. In this environment, there were a few definite advantages to being bipedal, and our ancestors adapted accordingly. Homo erectus had the same arch in their feet that we still have, which enables long-distance walking. Chimpanzees have flat feet and no butt. That, that just looks wrong. Unlike chimpanzees, we humans have a pronounced gluteus maximus, the butt muscles. You can see them on gorillas, but not on chimps. And these butt muscles don't do much for walking, but they're great for running. Homo erectus had meaty butts like we do and that gorillas do. Something neither chimps nor gorillas have is an Achilles tendon. It was small when it first appeared in Australopithecus, but grew in the Homo genus. Elastic tendons help us to bounce while running, giving us an extra spring in our step, while our glutes do the same thing for our stride. We still don't run very fast, but we could run farther on two legs than a chimp could on four. For all their strength and speed, they'd still be exhausted very quickly and would collapse and pass out if they tried to keep up, where we can keep on going and going. Chimpanzees use coordinated group efforts when hunting red colobus monkeys in the jungle canopy. Early humans evidently did the same, except on the ground in wide open spaces where it is impossible for a few people to trap their quarry by surrounding it. Instead, you gotta chase it down. Rigorous exercise, like running around all day, generates excessive body heat. When you already live in a tropical environment, that could cause heat stroke, which can be deadly. But we had a couple more adaptations, enhancing our endurance across the savanna. The most obvious is our lack of hair, except on our heads. And this is probably because hair on the head provides shade for the scalp to prevent brain bake in the tropical sun. The only other noticeable patches of body hair we have are correlated with the development of secondary sexual characteristics. In other words, beards, armpits, and pubic hair. Otherwise, we look mostly hairless. We still have the same number of hair follicles as the other apes, but each of our body hairs is miniaturized, being neither as thick nor as long as theirs, thus making us appear 
naked. Of course, fossils can't tell us when this happened, but genetics gives us a clue. Not our own genetics, but that of our parasites, which continue to evolve right along with us. You see, human hair lice is as closely related to chimpanzee lice as we are to chimpanzees ourselves, which makes sense, of course, since both lineages split at the same time over six million years ago. But human pubic lice, colloquially known as crabs, are an entirely different species that are much more closely related to gorilla lice. This fact cannot be accounted for by our evolutionary divergence from a common ancestor with gorillas eight million years ago because a genetic analysis of crab lice implies that they split from gorilla lice infesting humans instead only 3.3 million years ago, which is four million years after our lineage split from gorillas and roughly three million years after we diverged from chimpanzees. So we caught gorilla lice sometime later. Awkward. However that happened, it seems that our pubic hair and the hair on our heads were like two lice islands separated by an impassable stretch of relatively naked skin where the hair is too thin and wispy for the parasites to cling onto or hide in. And remember that Lucy, the first Australopithecus afarensis fossil ever discovered, was dated to 3.2 million years ago. If she was a direct ancestor of our lineage, she would likely have already been a mostly naked ape. So early humans, having lost their fur, were then air-cooled. Of course, it's more efficient to be water-cooled, and we adapted that too. All primates have numerous apocrine glands in their hairy skin, but only hominini, meaning humans, chimpanzees, and gorillas, have an axillary organ, which produces an odor that is almost identical in all three genera. So hominini all have the same stink. We smell like apes. Likewise, the apocrine gland is visibly identical in all three genera, except that it functions differently in humans, in that it secretes sweat. We also have millions of eccrine glands, which are just like apocrine glands, except that they're not attached to follicles. They sweat as well, allowing us to drip with sweat to dissipate body heat. And this gave us the ability to employ a hunting technique that almost no other hunter could. Most predators will try to ambush their prey, where they hide and wait and jump out and grab, or they'll get as close as they can and then run out as fast as they can, and they can be really fast when they have to, but most of them can't go really fast very far. So if the prey animal is also really fast, then all they have to do is out-sprint the attacker. And if they can do that, then pretty quickly both predator and prey have to stop and take a breather and try to cool down again. But what happens when you hit something like the Terminator coming after you? He doesn't run very fast. In fact, he's only jogging. But he is still running, which means you gotta run too. And it absolutely will not stop, ever until you are dead. It's like those zombie movies where the zombies shamble really slowly and you can always run away, but you can never get away because they don't stop coming. It's the same with a prey animal in the savannah. You can easily dart away again and again, but every time you think it's safe to catch your breath, there they are still coming after you, following your tracks at speed. So you never get a chance to cool down. You gotta keep running till you drop or until your brain overheats and you just can't run anymore. And the last thing you see when exhaustion forces you to give up is the hunter closing in to get you. Because early humans were not as fast as anything else in the savannah, they had to run down their prey this way. So there was obviously a strong selective pressure on early humans to adapt and improve heat dissipation. Under extreme conditions, a chimpanzee will produce only a few beads of sweat on the face, and that's about it. But over many hundreds of thousands of generations, our sweat glands have gotten to where they produce copious amounts of sweat all over the body when necessary, adapting an existing structure for a new purpose, thermal regulation. There is only one other predator that has a different means of tracking and a different means of heat dissipation, and they can go really fast when they have to, but this one other super predator uses coordinated group strategies for persistence hunting like we do, and those are canids, dogs. We're the only two animals to ever use this technique, which is probably the common bond between us that eventually allowed us to become best friends. Though that was not the case when we first met a couple million years ago when dogs 
were among the most terrifying things in our world. Hellhounds on your trail, boy! Hellhounds on your trail! <laughs> This list of changes from generalized apes to humans includes a lot more than I could possibly fit into this one video. So we'll try to cover the rest of our human evolutionary development in the next and probably last installment of this series. In nearly all of these episodes so far, I've asked the viewer whether you understand and accept your classification into whatever category each episode was talking about. This time, however, we're at the homo genus, what sounds like homogenous. A word that means of the same kind. And coincidentally, in this case, it's the same kind as you are. Everyone accepts that we're all human. Hopefully, none of you are going to try to pretend that you're something else instead.